pleased to have the executive director of Citizen Action with us today. And uh, he's going to uh, be our uh, final speaker. And uh, we're privileged that uh, he's able to be with us. Uh, Robert Hay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's always heartening to see a good big group of progressives on a snowy spring day in Wisconsin. So my name is Robert Craig. I'm executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin. And uh, from our great speakers earlier, you've heard and you know as, as activists a lot of the problems we have. Now, the research indicates actually that any effective message should be no more than 25% negative. Uh, in order to draw other people, because what it does is, and we're not talking to other people, so this isn't a critique, but I want you to know. There you go. No, no, aspirational ending, Lisa, actually. But, um, but the point is, when we talk to everyone else, we need to pull everyone else in our direction. This is sort of the vanguard, and then we're, and we're branching out. And the biggest challenge we face is this. We have a system of government and an economy that is largely discredited. And you see anti-establishment voices on the left and the right, both ascendant. So you have Bernie Sanders and you have Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, right? With very different messages on what they built. So, you know, in the early 1960s, the polling numbers were off the charts that people believed in the credibility in their, of their government to do the right thing, to tell the truth, to represent the people. And now it's the opposite. And now the most unpopular institution in the country, other than Donald Trump, is Congress, right? I think Trump's a little worse, actually, on negatives. And so that's a problem for progressives, because we're the ones who believe our democratic government is the key to creating opportunity and security for everyone. And so when government is discredited, democracy is discredited, government has been made a negative word by the right, it's our democracy. When it's discredited, we can't do the things we need to do to create a just society. And so in a very perverse way, when the right runs government to the ground, they actually advance their own ideology. So when Katrina happened, it actually helped conservative ideology. There's government failing again. If you look at Flint and the water crisis, what's interesting is it's government failing again. So it actually, even though it's the right doing it, it actually advances right-wing ideology. And, in, and what's really troubling about that is if you look at the discourse around Flint, what the right is saying is, is that see, they're saying, see, government has failed, government's poisoned people. Uh, what Democratic politicians are saying is, this is a scandal and we should go after this one governor. They're not saying, in clear terms, this is what happens when you put people who hate government in charge of government. <laughs> And here is, and quite frankly, we need to be, at the end of the day, we need to be the people who believe in America and believe that America can still do anything. And to paint them for what they are as the negative people that say we can't do anything more, anymore. Now, you can't have affordable college. You can't reduce poverty. You can't have an economy that works within the ecology and doesn't lead to a global climate disaster. None of these things are possible anymore. That's what they're actually saying, and it's not true, because we are a richer country than we have ever been. We maldistribute the wealth more than before, but we have more money, much more than we had in the 1960s when we thought we could solve any problem. We could go to the moon, we could eradicate poverty, we could create civil rights, we could create a society where that was actually colorblind, not fake colorblind, where what color you were born, whether you were Latino, African American, Native American, or any ethnic or Asian didn't matter as far as your life prospects. We believed all that was possible. Now we don't. And so, but people have a yearning for that kind of aspiration. And so that is the key. We not only need to talk about the problems, we must talk about Alec. We must talk about how the campaign finance system and the economy has been rigged. But then we also need to talk about how we have an, a credible vision for what America can do if we work together again. And if we stop the politics of division, because their ideology is based on dividing people, yep. and it is a coded racism, and the, 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 what's concerning about them, for them, for about Trump is, Trump is talking outside the code. <laughs> and they don't like that, they're very fearful of that. The fact is, he's saying the same things in open that they've been saying in a coded way all along. <laughs> is that, 
and the, the title of this little talk, and, and I have three different breakouts and I'm talking at dinner, so we'll delve into these issues in more detail, but is that we need a revised progressive playbook. And it, need, and it needs to be a playbook for winning. And what that means is, if you look at, uh, if you look at Mike McCarthy on the sidelines, so the Green Bay Packers, he has all of those laminated sheets, right? They have a very careful game plan that they're adjusting based on what the opposition is doing. And that's what we need. And we have a number of problems on the left. One of them is, I mean, Paul Waldman, the head of Media Matters, once said, if you want to structure a movement to fail, you structure it the way the left is structured. <laughs> that is, tons of small organizations that are at a subsistence level, that don't have the capacity in themselves to change public opinion, divided on issues. So we, we argue each issue out separately. It's sort of a problem of technical rationality, not realizing that, whereas you look at the right, they have the same kind of uh, values-based discourse, uh, not very good values, across every issue area. So everything with them comes back to government is the problem, right? And ours does not. We, we argue everything out in, with small organizations within issue silos, and then we don't change worldview. And the problem is that they, for, uh, since the Powell memo that Lisa talked about, they have had a consistent strategy for 40 years to change worldview. Which means if you look at their rhetoric, and they don't need to be geniuses because they have a very clear playbook that even Scott Walker can read. <laughs> and so all they have to do is repeat it, okay? Whereas our leaders have to be brilliant because they invent it on their own. Because there's, there's, there's not a clear choir, there's not a clear hymn book as we need. And so we, what we, the, what, but if you look at their discourse, if you look at, say, the, uh, Walker's State of the State, and I'll talk about this in the Progress Center Communication Breakout, uh, his State of the State speech had a very clear worldview of how the world works and used it to justify his policies. Whereas the Democratic response was simply about uh, critiquing Walker's policies with no broader vision. And so we need to have that broader vision in everything we do. I could give you kind of an, uh, an ecological metaphor for this. It's like if we don't do two things in all our discourse, that is, respond to what we're doing right now, try to elect a candidate, win on an issue, but also build a broader worldview and common sense about the world, then we're wasting communication. So when we spend millions of dollars to try to elect a governor, and our communication has nothing to do with building a broader progressive worldview, it is incredibly wasteful. We might as well be throwing all this garbage out the car window because we're not building something in what we do. And so it's very important we start to do that. And that we do it around what is possible, things that people actually believe in. So if you look at, for example, and by the way, if you look at the economy, I'll just give an example, I'll have, I'll have a breakout on the economy. One of the problems we have about uh, building a, a, a kind of a progressive economic agenda is, is that the public has been sold a, a, a bill of goods by a lot of people, by conservatives, but by a lot of other mainstream people, that the economy is like the weather. It's some sort of natural force, right? Yeah. And we wait to hear the stock report to see how it's going. There's hail today and the stock market went down, right? That's what we hear there. It's the people. So what's brilliant about Elizabeth Warren's term that the economy is rigged is that someone has to rig it, right? It was rigged by the top, not just the 1%, the top 0.1%. And if it's rigged, if we talk about it that way, then it could potentially be unrigged. So we can take the global trading system. It's not about being for trade or against trade. It's whether we're going to create a global trading system only for the benefit of multinational corporations so it can play workers off each other, so it can lower wages in the United States and exploit uh, labor in other countries, right, and not treat them very well either. Or you could create it in the interest of average people, a global trading system that actually encouraged increased wages in every country, adjusted to the level of development, which would of course create more prosperity. Why? Because it's, it, it's common sense that people have money in their pockets, they spend it in the local economy, which create, creates more jobs. And so you actually have a conservative philosophy, and this is what you're seeing in Walker's economic numbers, where if you take money out of people's pockets, it decelerates the economy. Okay, so that's what's happening right now. All the savings that were, were won by taking money away from public employees, those were taken out of the economy because the money of teachers and firefighters and other public employees is, spends just as well in a small business as any other money. And he pulled it out of the economy, right? And if we actually have a low-wage system, right now, uh, Wisconsin, as, you, as many of you know, factually has had the, our middle class shrink more than any other state in the country since the year 2000. And we, almost all the jobs we lost 
during the Great Recession were middle wage and high wage jobs, and almost all the jobs we're creating uh, during this alleged recovery are poverty wage jobs, which is why for the first time in, in Wisconsin history, potentially, but in, in memory, the, the employment rate is going up at the same time the poverty rate is going up. In other words, it's not just a job quantity problem, it's a job quality problem. And what is our strategy to create family supporting jobs? It's non-existent, right? And so, but here's the problem. The cynicism about government means is that average people across the state don't believe that their government has anything to do with creating more opportunity. So they kind of have the attitude, well, we might as well make it easier on business because it couldn't hurt and I don't know what else to do. Though they also have very low expectations. They think it's just natural, things are happening naturally. Their job left, not because of it, because of something, it's just bad luck. The manufacturing jobs have started leaving for some reason. Nothing to do with anything any people did, right? And that's something we need to challenge. Now, the opportunity we have is this, that the conservative ideology, as brilliant as it is in its creation, it can't describe the reality people are experiencing. So we need to take advantage of that. So that's the opportunity. It cannot account for what's going on. So I'll give you, I'll give you a quick example, but this stands in for a lot of others. I gave a speech in February in Warsaw about why opportunity is declining in, the, in, in Wisconsin and why poverty is increasing and what we can do about it. And the Tri-County News, apparently a very conservative editor, editorialized thus in response. They said, quote, if anything is challenging manufacturing in Wisconsin, it is the question of whether or not the workforce is there to meet the demand for growth. Manufacturers in the Tri-County News area, I think that's Marathon, Lincoln, and Langrade County, and beyond are thriving and growing. Their future depends on having a society which still wants to work for a living instead of sitting on their couches and waiting for the next government check to arrive. So, in the Wausau area, it's well known that the manufacturing jobs have been leaving in droves. But apparently that's not the problem, it's still growing. And apparently the problem is that the previous generations of folks in central Wisconsin used to go to work and now they're on couches taking those great welfare checks that I didn't think were coming anymore after we ended welfare as we knew it in the 1990s. Right? I don't know what welfare program they're even talking about here, right? And so they can't describe what's going on or explain it. The only reason they're having any, they have any sway at all is because we haven't made the, a powerful case the other way. And the case has to be not only the economy is rigged against average people, not only that when people cannot afford the basics, when they can't spend money in their own community, it, it damages the economy, creates unemployment, but that we can create a fair economy together using our democratic <laughs> government. We need to make that case, which means we need to purify democratic government, which gets back to what, uh, what Jay was talking about and, uh, and what Matt was talking about and what Lisa was talking about. The corruption they were talking about makes it harder for us to do these things because people don't trust that if you take the government and you, that if we give more money to the government and we give more power to, to our democracy, then it will lead to anything other than giving more special benefits to the wealthy and to large special interests. So we have to purify our government in order to deal with our biggest problems and create hope that people have that we can control our own future. But the other problem is that we know that most people, you, you're, you folks, you're the vanguard, you care about clean government and remember what government used to like and be like in Wisconsin. If you do polling in Wisconsin, people will say, yeah, I don't want money in politics, but they don't vote on it. And the reason they don't vote on it is because the immediate issue is more their economic anxiety. Since the 1970s, we've created an extremely anxious economy where everyone is very worried about their kids and their future. So we need to make the connection and say the reason the economy is being rigged is because of our corrupt campaign finance system and put the issues together. So we need to show the consequences that matter to them in an impure system and then clean up government. So we, so we cannot use government unless we purify government, but we can't really do either of them unless we connect the consequences to the process. And so that's what we need to do. The other thing we need to think about here, and I talk a lot about message right now, is we also need to think about how we organize ourselves. And so we need to be really experimenting a lot with new, for, new democratic formations that can help us organize ourselves. Because right now, the only counterbalance uh, to, the, to the huge special interests with their unparalleled money, uh, with Citizens United completely legalizing virtually everything as, as the uh, decision has been wound out by the federal courts and by state courts, is the only thing we have left is that we still have one person, one vote, right? 
But in order to have one person, one vote, we have to actually energize people to take action. They can't, they, we can't just have passive acquiescence. In fact, if we debate them to a draw, but then people don't take action, we lose, right? And of course, action is not is voting, but it's also everything people do beyond voting, deeper civic involvement. So we know, for example, that volunteer grassroots groups are critical. A lot of you are members of those. That's what this, this whole conference is about. And they, they show the vibrancy of democracy in Wisconsin. But there's some limit to what they can do because they don't have institutional kind of force, right, with that permanence. And so they'll rise up, they'll have some, but there's a limit to how much power they can have without other kinds of alliances. So I know there's been a lot of thought about this. One thing we're doing at Citizen Action in Wisconsin, and we have a breakout on this, we'll talk about this at dinner, is that we created something called an organizing cooperative, an organizing co-op. And the idea is to have member owners who agree to give a certain amount monthly, but in return, they have governance and ownership. And the idea is we created one successfully in Milwaukee that has a full-time organizer. We just won a campaign in Eau Claire and the counties around it in western Wisconsin that Jeff Smith, the former state representative, is leading. And so we have two of them and growing, but the idea is to marry the activism of, of grassroots volunteer organizations, which Nate knows all about, with some kind of institutional capacity of an organization which has a union contract, is an employer, has access to other foundation and national money, so to marry the two, but to make sure the decision making is grassroots and organic, but there's also more capacity and power married to that. So I'm not saying that's the only solution, there are a lot of experimentation going on, but it's the kind of thing we need to figure out and work on in order to build the power that we see in this room, and that we see that grassroots activists are showing all over the, all over the state. And so, at the end of the day, I'm pretty hopeful in that uh, the problems that we face obviously cannot be answered by the right. The right has no explanation of what's going that, that's legitimate, of what's going on and why it's been going on. But we do need to realize that it's not just about facts, that it's about worldview, because facts will bounce off people if they, if they don't want to believe them. So if you listen to right-wing talk radio, what it really is is it's an exercise in motivated reasoning. And motivated reasoning is where you look for reasons to support what you already believe. What right-wing talk shows do is, is that they give their audiences an excuse to believe what they want to believe. And so that's why they give all these ridiculous rationales every day. It's almost like they're having a dialogue with themselves to try to justify themselves, right? And it's an amazing level of self-justification. Of course, with an ideology like this, you need that level of self-justification, <laughs> apparently. But we need to reach people at the values level, the worldview level, and, that, and to do that, we need to, de to, to, tie, to really uh, tap into their deepest aspirations. And if you think about it, people believe in an economy where everyone can make it, everyone has access to a good family supporting job and a way to get there, and people also believe already that the economy exists within an ecology. And if the economy kills the host, so to speak, then the economy will crash as well. Guess what? It's just a parasite at that level, right? And it won't be sustainable. So the greatest uh, uh, opportunity we have, one of the greatest opportunities we have, is to combine the ecological the, uh, movement, the environmental movement, which sprung up in this country at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, but especially in the 60s and 70s beyond, with the movement for economic justice, because then you have a double rationale for restructuring the economy and the, co and the common interest. You have the rationale of making sure we don't have a global climate catastrophe, and you have the rationale of equal economic opportunity for everyone, regardless of their race, regardless of how they started. And those are both very powerful values that need to be combined, but to do that, we need to break down the silos on the left and work together, and we need a compelling vision of what people are for, not just what we're against. So we need both. And uh, so that's what we'll, I'll be talking about in the breakouts, and that's the opportunity here, is that the right literally has no answer to the biggest problems that our country is facing, and we need to make sure that, that enough people understand that. And in fact, what we need to do is, because there is about 20% of the population, hopefully 20, if, you're, if I'm being less optimistic, I'd say 30% of the population, that is so ideologically right that they're unreachable, okay? So they're not our audience. What we need to do is we need to have a movement that draws everyone else in our direction and isolates them, basically, is what it needs to do. So, by the way, there are some message theorists who think that if your discourse is not alienating the far right, then it's not saying anything, and it's not doing anything. 
And so we need to think about that. We're actually trying to set it up so it's clear, so they are revealed as the outliers they are. And I want to close. That is the hope of Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is the too honest conservative. The conservative is actually saying what they believe in such no uncertain terms that it's going to divide all of the people that they've been drawing in their direction and fooling into voting Republican to the other side. That's the hope there. But in this general election, we cannot have a campaign that taps back to the center and plays it safe because we are in an anti-establishment year. And so if, we, if, if the Democratic nominee be becomes the voice of the establishment, then we have a great risk that the anti-establishment candidate of the right could trump the establishment candidate of the center. So we need to be very careful. And we need to speak to what we can do to change society and fundamental reform. So thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to talking to you.